When you're on vacation, great, you're on vacation, you're relaxing, but still exercise, still get some physical activity. Doesn't matter if you're in a hotel or where you're at, you don't need a gym. You take some resistance bands, do some squats and lunges and burpees. The thing is what we're doing at home, we have, it has to pervade our whole lifestyle. So it's not about, oh, I can't do it, I don't have time. You know what, nobody has time. Take 15 minutes of the day to meditate, to do some yoga, that's all it takes. Make sure you're not using the devices that are gonna stimulate brain activity, like the iPads and your phones. So when we're settling down for the night, and this goes for parents with kids too. I know we like to give them the iPads to kind of, and I'm guilty of it, to kind of shut them up or to keep them occupied because we're busy, that's fine. But an hour before bedtime, there's been studies that show after we turn these devices off or watch TV or anything like that, our brain waves are still actually active for the next hour. Everyone, welcome back to High Intensity Health Radio. It's Mike Mutzel. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today, we're live with Dr. Deepa Verma, and we're going to talk about poop and the gut and IV therapies and a whole bunch of stuff in between. She's board certified in internal medicine, and she practices in Clearwater, Florida. She has a busy integrative medical clinic. So, Dr. Verma, thanks for being here. Thank you, Mike. Awesome. So I know you have a personal story to share with uh, that kind of led you into integrative functional medicine and in this whole you know field that's emerging and growing. So do you want to kind of talk about your clinical practice and what got you into integrative functional medicine? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I I, was, um, I am actually a traditional MD, uh, practice family medicine, internal medicine. But you know, I never really I don't follow my life. I don't live my life like that way. So I find I found it pretty contradictory and paradoxical to prescribe you know, pharmaceuticals to patients and see them only getting sicker, not getting better. It was basically putting a bandaid on their problems. You know, I, I found that, uh, you know, I would do these labs and I was just treating the disease, not the patient. You know, you look at these labs, you get the numbers. Um, you know, two years ago, my, my dad passed away unexpectedly and it was something I think that could have really been prevented. Um, about 15 years ago, he had a massive heart attack, which he was actually told he wasn't going to survive. He had his cardiac ejection fraction was probably like 5%. He was in cardiogenic shock. Later discovered that he had undiagnosed diabetes. Um, I thought that was pretty ironic because he grew up in an organic farm in India. His mom passed away at 90. His dad was 100. Never smoked, never really drank, you know, the occasional beer, never overweight, didn't eat meat, came here as a bachelor in the 70s. And after adopting the American lifestyle, that probably le you know, led him to where he was. So he had undiagnosed diabetes, which the doctors never told him he had high sugar. Um, I just can't, I can't even believe that. And this was in the, you know, the 90s and the late 90s. That led him to have a massive heart attack. From there, you know, I mean, how much more could you do? He was already living healthy, um, but he really got really strict and basically became a non-diabetic. Unfortunately, two years ago, uh, he his sugar dropped and his heart went into arrhythmia and it was just too late to resuscitate him. Um, he was 69 and he looked like he was probably 60, but that really spurred my the movement for me to really kind of pursue integrative medicine. Well, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. And as you know, it's very common for people to either have a personal health story that causes them to kind of wake up and realize that there's another approach to medicine or like, like your story, Dr. Verma is a family member gets sick or ill and they become disenchanted with the traditional medical system of just kind of prescribing a pill for an ill. So lately you've been talking a lot about uh, IV nutrition and poop in the gut and so forth. So we know that the gut is integral to whole body health, but I think you take it, you've kind of integrated the best of Ayurvedic medicine with integrative functional medicine. So kind of talk about kind of the, the you know, the history of, uh, you know, the gut, the role that the gut plays in Ayurvedic medicine and how that, you know, kind of interferes with, uh, you know, health today. Sure. Um, yeah, it can, it can go back to Hippocrates about 2000 years ago. And he said, all disease begins in the gut. Um, and that's, there's no better truth than that. The gut is really our center for our well-being and our immunity. And I always like to tell patients, we have 100 trillion bacteria in the gut. That's about three to five pounds of everybody's body weight. If you take that number 100 trillion, that's, I mean, it's phenomenal. For every uh, human cell that we have in the body, we have 10 bacteria. So we have about 100 trillion bacteria. We have only 10 trillion human cells. Just to quantify that, if you line up $1 trillion bills from here to the sun, um, it would take you a hundred times to go back and forth. I mean, that's how excessive a hundred trillion is. 
the gut, when I say it is our center for immunity, all the disease processes that we're starting to see now that are on the rise in America specifically, autoimmune diseases, obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, psychiatric disorders, things like autism and ADD, believe it or not, they do stem from the gut. I always like, you know, I love listening to Dr. Perlmutter. Um, he, you know, stresses the neuroenteric function. You know, when we talk about things like depression and anxiety, you know, we, we, we have serotonin in the gut. We have a very strong connection that affects our hormones and our neurotransmitters transmitters. The reason why we're seeing people so sick, you know, is because we're not absorbing the nutrition. We're not absorbing our vitamins and our minerals. We have leaky gut. So I always say the it starts in our mouth and it ends in, with our rectum. It's a hollow tube. It's supposed to be impermeable. Things are not supposed to be going in and out. When that's compromised, we have foreign sub or what the body recognizes as foreign substances invading the space and causing inflammation. And those tight junctions that are lining the gut, they're open and they're letting things go back and forth. So we're causing so many issues. And these are things caused by gluten, by artificial sweeteners, by exposure to industrial chemicals, dental fillings, metal you know, plastic bottles. And America, you know, we are very guilty of having all of these things and not banning any of these substances. So we've created an epidemic of leaky gut, of IBS, of micronutrient deficiency. And I always like to point out, we live on processed foods and fast foods. When we look at other countries, we say, oh, well, you know, they're eating croissants, they're eating meat, they're having their wine. But guess what? Their stuff is fresh. It's pure. They go to the market every day, every day. Things that are banned over in Europe, our list, we don't have anything that's banned. We're tainting our foods with, you know, heavy metals and toxins and we're feeding the kids. You know, I have three boys. I do not let them have sports drinks. I'm not going to name any types of sports drinks, but these have flame retarded chemicals in there. You know, I tell them drink coconut water. I make them fresh, you know, juice. These are things that are healing the gut and that are reparative for the gut. Um, one of the big things I like to say is that we have a micronutri micronutrient deficiency, an epidemic in America. We're probably one of the most progressive and advanced and wealthiest nations in the world. Yet we have our nutritional status is comparable to that of a third world country. You know, at least <laughs> I always say, at least they can eat dirt and they get their minerals and stuff <laughs> from there. You know, what are we doing? We're killing basically our health. And vitamin D is. Vitamin D deficiency is the number one cause of chronic disease in all Americans. And that's responsible for obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, immunity problems, cancer. Um, the levels, when I get the testing done, they generally say 30 to 100. But, you know, you need a level of like 70 to about 100 to really be optimal. And most people I test, I'd say nine out of 10 people I test are in their low teens or 20s. I mean, that's critically low. So I see, you know, that's where we start to kind of heal and repair the gut. And that's that's the issue that I like to focus on is to kind of start from there. And then we start balancing everything else because this integrative medicine is the synergy of the mind, body, and spirit. So in traditional medicine, we're dissecting the body. We're actually looking at the brain, the heart, the gut. There's a specialist for every part of the body. And I know it. I was a traditional doctor. But in integrative medicine, if your brain's not functioning, it's going to affect the heart. It's going to affect the gut and vice versa. So it's taking 100 puzzle pieces and taking all of them and putting them together and making a big picture, not taking a fragmented look at what's going on. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot to pull away from there. But just want to highlight something about the vitamin D is you're practicing Clearwater, Florida. I mean, I don't know the, you know, how many sunny days of year you have every year, but I'm sure it's in excess of 250, if not more. So, you know, if you were practicing in, you know, North Dakota, I would say, okay, most of your patients are deficient in vitamin D, but I think that's something that a lot of under, uh, people don't understand. And I worked at a medical clinic with an integrated medical doc, uh, and he was the uh, physician for our local fire department. And we tested firefighters who actually work outdoors. A lot of them, uh, when they're off, you know, they have these really flexible schedules and majority of them were vitamin D deficient uh, and of 3,000 patients. And this is in Colorado where it, it was sunny, you know, 300 plus days a year. So that's a huge nutrient that everyone needs to be aware of. So thank you for sharing that. But you hit on a lot of our listeners, uh, Dr. Verma, are, are parents. You know, they have children and um, we're always trying to improve the health of our families. And I just want to kind of pull apart some things that you said there on the sports drinks, replacing that with coconut water, which is amazing. But what are some other tips and, and so forth? I, I see this is an area where people struggle, even people that know what to do. They don't want to fight with their kids and other kids are doing it. So this is, they do it anyways. Like share with us, you have three active boys. What, you know, how do you, you cook all your own food? Like talk to us about that. Yeah, you know, I'm a single mom of three boys, you know, running my own practice. So I'm busy and I can say I don't have time. The amount of time it takes for us to drive 
uh, to McDonald's and pick up a Happy Meal, it's 15 to 20 minutes, right? I get home and that 15, 20 minutes, I'm boiling some quinoa, steaming some broccoli, maybe having a little salmon. It takes just as much time or less to do that while you're spending quality time with the kids. It starts really in utero. I, w- I made sure I had really great pregnancies. I was very lucky to have great pregnancies. I did all natural, you know, and I didn't even take any uh, Tylenol or Motrin. So I was very lucky there. I breastfed all my kids too. It really starts in utero, like I say. And when they come out, they're relying on the breast milk, you know? So I made sure I was eating properly so they can get the nutrition. Of course, if you can't breastfeed, there's always other alternatives. You still can eat well and you can still provide for the baby. But, you know, when parents say their kids are picky eaters, I have a hard time kind of buying that because I'm not saying force feed your kids, but they're eating what you give to them. They're they're eating what you're putting out to them. If <laughs> They're not going to starve. They're going to eat something. So it really starts with how the parents are presenting it. What we buy in the store and we stock in our, in our pantry, that's what they're going to eat. If you're putting donuts in there and potato chips and soda, that's what they're going to grow up knowing. I don't put that stuff. I don't even have a pantry. When I built my house, I actually did away with the pantry and made, <laughs> made it a little wet bar just to have for, you know, adult fun. But I, I, it's perishables. It's going shopping. If you have to do it every two to three days, just like they do in other countries where you're walking to a fresh market, do it. So my biggest thing, and another thing I think there might be some debate here is our bodies are not really meant to process milk after a certain time. Um, and I'm talking about animal protein. And there's a really wonderful documentary called Forks Over Knives, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard. And there's there have been more documentaries like Fed Up and Super Size Me. Animal protein is very destructive for the body. And I actually wrote an article discussing how um, detrimental animal protein t- is to our body. We're not even meant to really process that. If we take milk, for example, um, our lactase persistence decreases after about age five. We are the only animal species that continues to drink milk after we're weaned from the mom. And we're the only animal species that drinks milk from another animal species. We don't see any other mammals doing that. Um, dairy protein, animal protein actually acidifies the body. So when we talk about a clean body and a state of alkalinity, our bodies are very acidic. We're pumping our bodies with, uh, you know, things like processed foods and soda and coffee and uh, you know sugars and uh, sugar sweeteners and all those type of, you know, things. They're acidifying the body. That gives rise to chronic diseases. Cancer thrives in acidity. To really clean and detoxify the body, we want to create alkalinity. And that's kind of removing, you know, animal protein. What's really interesting and what I tell all my patients and even kids there is more protein in plants than there than there is in animals. If you take a serving of broccoli and spinach, it has twice as much protein, about 11.2 grams of protein, as if you take steak or beef or eggs or fish, only about five grams of protein. And our body is made to process that. We're made, when I'm talking about poop, our poop really says a lot about our health. And it's so funny to talk about. And I, I think Dr. Oz actually had a show on that. When you're pooping, take a look at it. Look at the form, the color, even the odor. You know, we're meant to poop about two to three times a day. We have to eat, we have to digest, we assimilate, then we eliminate. If we're not doing that, there is something going wrong in the body. When we're eating meat and those kind of things, meat starts putrefying and rotting in about four to five hours. True carnivores will eat raw, bloody meat. We have to cook our meat before we eat it. I mean, that tells you something. We're not meant to process it. Their intestines are only five times their body length. Our intestines are 12 times our body length. That's similar to what herbivore herbivores are. We are omnivores, of course, because by choice we can eat meat and fish and that's fine. But to sustain ourselves on that. And then the argument is, well, the Neanderthals, the Paleolithic, you know, those, those type of people, they were meat eaters. Actually, that's that's wrong. If we actually look back in time, they had a diet that was very high in fish and grain and nuts and mushrooms and the plant protein. It's just that we can trace the animals because they leave behind bones. Plants, you don't really leave much in the way of uh, proof, but animals, of course, are going to be bones and things like that. So when we go back in time, we find these fossils and we find things like that, of course, and we can see that they were eating meat. But it, from what we've discovered and analyzed, um, they did actually have a diet that was very high in plant protein. So really, that's kind of how humans have evolved. You know, if you think about it, we don't need our wisdom teeth, you know, we there's certain things that have become kind of obsolete that we don't need um, because we just... We're not living in those times. We're more refined and we can process these things and sustain ourselves on plants. So that's what I like to, you know, really tell our patients is vegetarians, we're not, you're not, you, yeah, you're thin, you're lean. 
you're not thin and sickly, you're lean and you're healthy. And, you know, if we look at all the animals in the animal kingdom that are vegetarian, our strongest creatures are vegetarian. Horses. I mean, horses are so, so, we measure things in horsepower. If you look at them, beautiful hair, they have muscle, they're very lean. They only eat plants. We have gorillas and elephants and, you know, uh, rhinoceros, all those things. They, they eat only plants and they're very, very strong. If we look at the carnivores in our animal kingdom, sure, they're big and they're grizzly and things like that, but they sleep about nine to 12 hours a day. They just get up to eat their prey. Then they're just lay around and go to sleep. So if we look at, you know, the, the, the difference between non-veg and veg animals, the energy is there. I, I, they're healthier, you know, and that can translate into the humans as well too. So I really think that we can be vegetarian and there's going to be no issue in terms of getting your complete nutrition because Plant protein, another great thing is plant protein, they're simple amino acids. So they break down and our body uses them. When we have animals, uh, that those amino acids are complex. They have to take, we have to, our body has to take an extra step to break it down. We're expending a lot of unnecessary, unnecessary energy to break that down. And that's just another, you know, uh, proof in the pudding that we're really not meant to consume and to really break it down. Once in a while, okay, if you want your steak once a month, you know, enjoy that. But to really have red meat and uh, pork and those type of things every day, you know, the rates of cancer are higher in non-vegetarians if we look at colon cancer and other types of cancer. Um, and there's always going to be debate and controversy with that. But, you know, from what I've studied and what I've researched, it is pretty evident that those are carcinogenic um, when, when they're in the body and over time when they accumulate. That's really great information. And I, I, I love having these different points of view. You know, we've had a lot of people on the show that are huge into animal protein and fish and, you know, from the paleolithic side. But, you know, the, the major downside to that is in addition to all the things you mentioned, like having to reinvest our own energy into breaking down and absorbing and so forth. Uh, the other major downside is the acidity. And it's so important to have, a you know, alkaline balance in your body for detox for all these various things and we don't want to fuel cancer um and so it's great to have these different perspectives and i would just kind of want to get your opinion then so um limit animal protein or no animal protein what what do you recommend to patients um you know it's hard to tell people really completely become vegetarian. I think it's going to be impractical for people. You know, we grew up with meat and potatoes and milk and OJ and really to revamp that whole lifestyle. I would say limit it. You know, there's this really great movement called the Reducitarian Movement. It was founded by Brian Cateman. Um, and I he did a TED talk on that. And I have the link as well for that. And I just spoke with him earlier today as well. I think it's realistic to tell people just limit it. You know, again, if you don't have to have meatloaf and hot dogs and burgers, there's going to be other options. You always have the veggie options. Once you start doing that and you integrate that into your life, I think people find that they feel better. They're more energetic. They're not getting sick as much. And a lot of my patients, they come back to me in about a month or two after they've done the detox diet that they put them on and really reduce their consumption of animal protein, which is dairy and meat. And they say, you know what, Dr. Verma, I really do feel great. I didn't really think I would, you know, feel this great. I thought I would miss the meat, but I really am not craving it. And the key there is when we're craving things, um, there is a deficiency somewhere. You know, we, we often hear of a pregnant women chewing on ice and things like that, you know, because they're iron deficient, you know, or when kids, you know, will, will eat like chalk or, or clay or uh, soil, they're deficient in some minerals. So when we're craving something like, for example, chocolate, when people crave chocolate, sure. Yeah. Chocolate's great. And you might have a, you know, your period coming on or hormonal imbalance, but you're probably deficient in magnesium and zinc, you know, nuts, those type of things. When you're craving sugar, let's look at the imbalance with your insulin and what's going on there. You might be pre-diabetic, you know? So although we chalk things up to genetics a lot, a lot of it, we're actually inundating our body with so much, so much negative, uh, the, the foods and the, the chemicals, the, I call it body burden. We're putting such a burden on our body. It doesn't even know how to detox. And our body's innate wisdom is to rid itself of poison. If it can't excrete it, it's going to back up. It's going to eventually the, the liver and the uh, the kidneys, which are our centers for detox, they're going to actually give up. And then what happens is we start sequestering those poisons in fatty tissue, muscle, joints. I mean, our brain is 60% fatty tissue. No wonder we have a rise of things like multiple sclerosis and certain neurologic disorders. I mean, it's sad to say, and I, you know, when people say, yeah, it's genetics, it runs in my family. Genetics does play a role, but I'll tell you the environmental factors are are twice as powerful as that because we are just not doing our body any justice. And our body's pretty miraculous because it can bounce back and it can repair itself. But you know what? After a certain amount of time, when we get into our 40s and our 50s, when everything is on the decline anyway, like our hormones and our nutrition and our digestive enzymes and um, 
human growth hormone, all those things, our body just can't fight back anymore. When we're in our 20s and 30s, we can almost abuse our body and we can like fight back, you know, and we're like, oh, you know, I, I, I can eat potato chips and soda and I'm not going to the gym and I still look pretty good. But then the majority of people I see are in their, you know, 30s, going into their 40s and 50s. And that's when they're complaining of, I can't lose the weight. I'm feeling tired. I just don't have a sex drive. My energy's low. And I don't know. It's just, you shouldn't, I tell people you shouldn't suck them to the fact that you're going through a midlife crisis. Yeah. You're married. You have kids whatever you have kids. It's not the end of the world. You should actually take it to the next level. I told myself after I had my kids, that's, this is going to be a time where I'm going to feel my best and look my best. And, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, brag or boast, but the people do tell me I look probably like 15 years younger than I really am. And I, you know, I, people tell me my average age is 25. Yes. Is it flattering? But then I think to myself, this is what patients want. They're telling me, what, what do you do, Dr. Verma? How do you look the way you do? How do you live the way you do? That's really what also inspired me to start this type of practice because I really couldn't sit there and give patients those pharmaceuticals and tell them, take this, this uh, X and Y and you know what? Don't worry about those other five side effects that you see on the commercial that is so gratuitously advertised, you know. Um, talk to your doctor about the risks of heart attack and stroke and even death. But what do you say to the patient? You know, sure, take this medicine. It'll help your cholesterol. But you're going to get muscle pain. You're going to get uh, liver dysfunction. Eventually, you're going to have all these problems. And, you're, you know, the number one cause of death in America is polypharmacy. When people die, they're on an average of about 10 to 20 medications. And I often have patients in their 50s who say to me, my doctor's surprised that I'm on no pharmaceuticals. I'm like, that's great. That's how it should be. We just accept the fact that we take a pharmaceutical. You just even take two pharmaceuticals, an antibiotic and say an acid blocker. Think about all those reactions. I remember I used to type those um, those prescriptions in and you'd always get an alert, like beware, you have these adverse reactions. I Can you imagine being on three, four or five? I... I would, I would rather kill myself than to be on pharmaceuticals. And I know that sounds harsh. I probably take about 20 supplements, but if I can't prevent those illnesses and those genetics from coming into play, then I don't know, you know, I must be doing something wrong. But right now I have diabetes and heart disease, both sides of the family. And being of Eastern Indian descent, there's a high rate of, you know, diabetes and heart disease um, with the lipoprotein defects and things like that. I'm going to do everything that I can to put that off. And, you know, it's getting in-depth blood work, checking your inflammatory markers, your genetic markers. You can do something about it. Absolutely. You can do something about it. You, you we just can't say, you know what? My dad died of diabetes. My mom died of a heart attack. That's just going to happen. The average age of death, the life expectancy is 94 in America or around there. 94. But the quality of life probably after like 70 just goes downhill. We work all our life to make money and we pay little attention to our health. And then when it comes to our health, we don't want to spend the money, you know, and insurance is, it's really difficult to deal with it. And that's why I really, I shied away from insurance and I, I run a, a cash base, a fee for service practice, because unfortunately in America, healthcare is really, uh, becoming a big obstacle for us to get healthy. And I know, a lot there, again, I might get a lot of debate, a lot of heat for that, but, you know, insurance pays for sickness. Insurance is meant for sickness, for catas catastrophic, you know, instances. So when we code those, you know, if you're diabetic, you're 250.00, you're hypertensive, you're 401.1, everybody's a number. And you have 15 minutes, we have to churn out the volume. You I can sit down with a patient for 90 minutes the amount of information that I get, just even in the 30 minutes that I talk with them, they're telling me their psychosocial aspect. They're telling me their family history, their physical, all their ailments meant, I mean, they're pouring out their life story to me, their heart out to me because they don't have a chance to do it with anyone else. You know what their doctor will tell them to do? They're depressed. Go talk to a psychiatrist. You know, they're telling them that your brain is not connected to the rest of the body. Your depression and anxiety is not connected to your gut. You know, we feel butterflies in our stomach. That's a great saying because anxiety and all that stuff that starts in the gut. So again, everything, it just goes back to the same thing. Like we have to take care of ourselves and look at the mind, body, and the spirit just kind of working together. And like I said, the gut is really where it all starts. And that really influences everything else. Um, you know, autism and ADD, of course, you know, there's controversy with the vaccines and things like that. But again, it's the food. You know, I have I have parents who bring me their kids and they say they just are not concentrating in class. Part of it, yes. Part of it's being a child. We have, you know, we have a certain amount of ADD and things like that. But I say, Let, what are they eating? OK, Pop-Tarts for breakfast. They're having popsicles. They're having colored juices. I ban that stuff. I don't give that stuff to my kids. I make them fresh juice. I say have the colors of the rainbow. That's in nature. 
beets and spinach and carrots and apples. And you know, once in a while they'll go to a birthday party. Are they going to have that cupcake? Yeah. I'm not going to rob them of their childhood, you know, that they're, they're, but they're going to grow up knowing that soda is bad for them, that juices are bad for them, that, you know, the processed sugars are bad for them. I, for parents out there, I'm going to tell you, look at what you're giving your kids. Stop taking them to the fast food restaurants. Spend quality time at home while you're cooking. Have them do the homework around the table. Cook something. You know, quinoa takes eight minutes to cook. You know, make them gluten-free pasta. Make them roasted veggies. Do something like that. Have a piece of salmon. You know, spend t- quality time with them, but also nurture their health, nurture their brain, their intelligence. I give my kids vitamin D. I give them probiotics. I give them fish oil. I make sure that they have, you know, the fresh whole juice that I make in the morning. So my morning routine, for example, I make them, um, I call it like a paleo shake. You know, it's a high a, a shake that's loaded with um, all the nutrition, all the vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and amino acids. I use non-dairy milk. So I use almond milk and coconut milk. I use bananas and avocado and spinach. I throw it in a magic bullet. I add chia seeds, which has 10 times more omega-3 acid than a serving of salmon. Hemp protein, hemp seeds has a tremendous amount of protein in there. So you're getting omega-3s, you're getting protein, you're getting all the colors from the fruits and vegetables. I throw in some frozen berries. Just, you know, I, I blend that up in the magic bullet. That's all it takes, you know, $50 invest in a magic bullet. And that's what the breakfast is. It's filling, it's full. And then the kids go to school and they come concentrate and that you'll you'll get feedback from the teachers say wow you know joey or danny they they felt great they look they did great today they weren't bouncing around and they were actually concentrating and they did well and they sat in their seat that's what i i hear from parents after they kind of revise their diet so that's my morning routine and it's you know about snacking throughout the day it's about eating well keeping your gut healthy keeping your tummy full it should be filled with half food a quarter liquid and a quarter empty we eat till we're fully satiated that's not what we're meant to do. Supersize me is another great thing to, to watch. Portion size in America, we're met, when they give us those portions, we're told that's normal. Really, quarter of what we're served is what we're supposed to be eating. And then, you know, doing little revisions here and there. We're not really meant to drink cold water, iced water, chilled water. In other countries, you have to ask for ice. Here, we're served ice. You have to tell them, don't give me ice. What I do is I tell them, I don't want ice. And then they'll bring me chilled water still. I said, you know what, just bring me the water that you used to serve tea and give me a little chilled water I'll mix in there. Lemon. Every morning, my my morning ritual, the first thing that I do when I wake up in the morning is have warm lemon water. That is the most powerful detoxifier that you can do in the morning time. Add a pinch of baking soda that causes alkalinity and you're set for the day. And you will just detox. You'll go to the bathroom. You'll feel good. That creates such a great alkalinity. And you might say, well, lemons are acidic. How does that work? Once it gets metabolized in the body, it actually will create an alkaline environment by dissociating into the minerals and things like that. So yeah, if you're going to, you know, suck on um, lemons and things like that, of course, the acid is going to take the enamel off your teeth. However, when it's in your body and it's dissociating and it's getting metabolized, it's actually creating an alkaline environment. So um, I do that. And, you know, one of my most favorite uh, herbs or spices is turmeric. Turmeric is that beautiful, radiant, golden spice. We've been using that in India for several thousand years. That to me is um, that and coconut. If, if I were to pick two things, that and coconut, everything about a coconut, I'll get to that in a second. Turmeric is an anti-inflammatory. It's a powerful antiviral and antimicrobial, antiviral, antibacterial, antiparasitic. It helps um, with my arthritic patients. Their joint pains basically go away. And it just takes your immunity to a whole nother level. I mean, it really, really just, it, uh, it detoxifies you and it just makes you feel like you're a superhero because you, you're so cleansed and your immunity gets stepped up. And of course, you have to do this in conjunction with other things like vitamin D and vitamin C. But, you know, starting there and then coconut, um, coconut water is Mother Nature's most perfect drink. Actually, in the Vietnam War, when they ran out of um, IV solution, they would actually administer coconut water because it's so isotonic to our own you know, body. Um, and it has all the minerals and electrolytes and nutrients. So I, I always joke around that if you, if we get stranded on an island or if the last thing on earth was a coconut, we can actually sustain ourselves and live on just coconuts. The milk, the water, the meat, the sugar, the sugar has four grams of carbs in there. So if, that's a great substitute. Forget about, um, you know, aspartame and saccharin, things like sweet and low and um, what else is there? Splenda and all those type of things. Those things are just not good for the body. Stevia is natural. It does come from a plant. 
But believe it or not, those artificial sweeteners people are using because they want to curb diabetes. Guess what? That's actually causing diabetes. Because what that does, it's yeah, it's actually worse than having sugar to having just regular sugar. So your alternatives, for hands down, are going to be coconut sugar. Agave is great. Honey is great. They are hot. You know, hyperglycemic, so we have to use them, you know, sparingly. But those are the things that we can kind of. That's the movement I want to kind of create. You know, try to move to these more natural things. Um, Watch your carb intake, the processed food intake. Um, coffee is another big thing. I know I, people are going to hate me for this because we live in a nation that we <laughs> thrive on Starbucks. Hmm. Coffee actually, over time, you know, kills your adrenal glands. And we hear the term adrenal fatigue. Um, we've really thrown the HPA axis off. That's your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And that really is another cause of why our gut's off and why why we feeling so imbalanced in terms of our hormones and our thyroid you know, you know, we use things like Synthroid, for example, um, which is only targeting the T4, which is, you know, a hormone that is made from the thyroid, but T3 is our biologically active hormone. That's, um, 70 times more bioactive, 17 times more bioactive than T4. And, um, I like to use Armour Thyroid, for example. So, you know, of course, there's going to always be controversy in what traditional doctors do and what the more progressive integrative doctors do. But, if there was a message, it's just, just look at the whole body and look at the patient just because their labs are normal, because their TSH is falling in range that 0.5 to 4.5. Ideally, the range should be like more 0.5 to 1.5. So anything over 1.5, there's something going on with the thyroid. And look at what the patient's telling you. You know, if they're feeling tired, they're gaining weight and they're just not feeling right take their symptoms. Don't look at the, the numbers and treat their symptoms, treat the patient because they're going to thank you for it. Cause when they start feeling great, it's going to be because of you. So it's really, like I said, treating the patient, not just putting a bandaid over their problems or chalking it up to genetics or saying, well, your labs are fine. You know, we can't, we, well, I think we're scared to practice medicine because of all the medical legal issues. You know, we want to do everything by the book. That's what I was taught in medical school. You know, I'm a U.S. trained MD and we're not taught anything about integrative medicine. It was an elective for half an hour out of my four years. You know, do it if you want to do it. But we're taught practice medicine, follow this protocol. You know, you have chest pain, you go to the hospital, there's a protocol that you follow. You get your EKG, you get hooked up to the monitor, you get nitro, you get aspirin. If that's abnormal, you're going to go get admitted for 24 hours of observation. If something's abnormal there, you're going to get set up for a stress test. If something's abnormal there, you go for an, in for an angio, which is invasive. Um, so we really have to kind of step back and look at where the problems are. Look at the blood work, take time to talk to the patient and start with natural supplements, start with natural nutrition. You know, don't just hand them a, uh, a pharmaceutical like Plavix or Lipitor and expect things to get better. You know, remember Tim Resser, that anchor on CNN? He was on Lipitor. He had a normal stress test. And then he unfortunately died. You know, he dropped dead of a, a heart attack. So that's, you know, point in case is that you have to really look at the patient and look at their in-depth labs and their inflammatory markers and not just hand them a pharmaceutical and say, okay, go ahead and take it. You're going to be fine because unfortunately these things do happen you know, where people are not going to repair themselves. They're not going to get healthy and they're just going to suffer down the road and we're just going to keep adding on pharmaceuticals. So I want to kind of summarize, if, if you will, there and, and kind of, you know, go back a little bit. And uh, one thing that, that stood out was that you need to be, you know, the the change that you want to see. And so for yourself, you're trying to empower other people to make lifestyle choices to improve their health. So it wouldn't you wouldn't be very successful uh, doing that if you looked unhealthy. And so that's why you're so successful is because you walk the walk and talk the talk. So you are look very healthy, practice what you preach, you exercise and do these various things. So I think that's really important. And then when you talked about how a lot of Americans are on multi-medicines, polypharmacy, I think is the word you described. And Jeff Bland's been talking about that for a year. So this is a great soundbite for people who don't know about this. You know, uh, oftentimes functional, integrative, alternative medicine gets dubbed as unscientific, unscience-based. There's no research. But as Jeff Bland, you know, taught me back in like 2008, polypharmacy has never been studied. You know, an antidepressant combined with an anticoagulant combined with a lipid lowering medication combined with pain pills, that's never been clinically study that's as unscience based as taking you know doing one of these gallbladder flushes which i don't recommend you know but in terms of science there's there, that interaction has never been studied so if you're, if you're ever at a cocktail party and someone's saying oh there's no evidence for turmeric and joint pain say well there's no evidence for all the medicines that you, know, you or your family members may be on so that's really important but 
and let's kind of get back to poop and then we can kind of wrap up here. But uh, for folks that have you know constipation issues, like you mentioned, most people should be going, number two, going poop at least three times a day. And an easy way to get there is to just have more vegetables, have more fiber, get more water into the diet. So um, let's talk about some of your, your favorite vegetables uh, and you know dietary nutrients to increase the health of the gut microbiome. Yeah, we're told, you know, definitely increase fiber. And just, I just want to back up before I talk about that. We have to really look, you know, again, when I say we have hundred trillion bacteria in the gut, we've really thrown that, the, the bacterial flora off. Um, unfortunately, our overuse of antibiotics, um, most of the times we don't even need antibiotics or viral infections or just something. You know, we just overprescribe. So antibiotics and the processed foods, we've really created a diversity shift. So probiotics are a big thing now. And, you know, they're with merit. I mean, we do have to really restore that microbial balance in the gut to start processing. That's really, we need to start. Yes, we can throw fiber, we can throw laxatives at it, but we have to look at, you know, the yeast in there. We have to look at, you know, the microbes that we have in there, make sure that we're not having uh, yeast overgrowth, that we're not having parasites in there. So sometimes the stool tests are going to be very, very helpful for the uh, clinician to use with the uh, with the patient, but some of my, my favorite ones are the dark leafy green vegetables. Um, you know, besides the amount of nutrition and vitamins and minerals you can get, they really help kind of uh, bulk up the stool and keep the motility going. Um, so, you know, things like broccoli and spinach and kale, the cruciferous uh, vegetable family, which are, you know, Brussels sprouts and cauliflower and broccoli, they're very anti-cancerous too. So they're really good in um, stimulating the gut health and kind of uh, being very anti-carcinogenic. The other things that I like, um, you know, I like, it's it's the color of the rainbow. I love beets. Beets are really important because they actually stimulate nitric oxide production, um, which is the whole theory of like why Viagra was, you know, invented. Um, As we age, the nitric oxide that we secrete from our, the lining of our vessels decreases. And so that's how we start getting unhealthy, you know, vessels uh, in the arterial system. So our circulation gets compromised. So we do have a lot of gut flow. We hear of about rest and digest, you know, after we eat a big meal, a lot of that blood flow is going down to the gut. So we're kind of told to, you know, not go and do a strenuous activity because you're kind of, you drain the blood down there to increase that circulation and to have a good blood flow down there. Beets are great. Pomegranates are great. Um, you know, apples have a lot of isocarcetin. Carcetin is a powerful an- antioxidant uh, that helps, you know, um, with your overall immunity and keep the circulation going. I use that a lot with um, allergies, again, which a lot of that stems from the gut. So again, it's really choosing just a variety of fruits and vegetables. I do caution fruits um, for anyone and definitely for diabetics versus vegetables just because of the higher carbs and the sugar. Although they are natural sugars and they are healthy for you, it, they still have a high glycemic index. You know, things like apples, um, certain berries are going to be, you know, the low, low glycemic index, but just watch your intake of there. I would definitely have more vegetables than fruits, but a good way to do these kind of things is whole juicing. Uh, for example, one of my favorite whole juice, which I do every few days, um, are, are beets, spinach, apples, carrots, some frozen berries, maybe some pineapple in there. And just have a little amount because it does have a high amount of sugar. I do give that to my kids. That's the juice that they drink. Those are my favorite fruits and vegetables that are definitely good for your intestinal health. Um, just keep the colors vibrant and and really anything that you have is just going to, you know, keep it going. And, you know, great tip for when you're traveling, because so many people are on the go all the time. Um, I have been traveling a lot lately too. You know, just pack these things, pack the, you know, your, a protein powder, pack your supplements, pack the turmeric and, you know, easy portable things. And wherever you're going, fruit and vegetables are around the world. It, you have to maintain a routine and that, you know, it's when you're on vacation, great, you're on vacation, you're relaxing, but you get still exercise, still get some physical activity. It doesn't matter if you're in a hotel or where you're at. You don't need a gym. You take some resistance bands, do some squats and lunges and burpees. The thing is what we're doing at home, we have, it has to pervade our whole lifestyle. So it's not about, oh, I can't do it. I don't have time. You know what? Nobody has time. Take 15 minutes of the day to meditate, to do some yoga. That's all it takes. Make sure you're not using the devices that are going to stimulate brain activity, like the iPads and your phones. So when we're settling down for the night, and this goes for parents with kids too. I know we like to give them the iPads to kind of, and I'm guilty of it, to kind of shut them up or to keep them occupied because we're busy. That's fine. But an hour before bedtime, there's been studies that show after we turn these devices off or watch TV or anything like that, our brain waves are still actually active for the next hour. And that's why we have so many issues with sleep and with mood and, uh, you know, those type of problems, you know, the ADD and all that kind of stuff. So it's 
get back to nature, you know, like go outside, ride a bike. And, you know, if the weather permits, just be outside and have fun or play board games with your children, organize activities that they can do it. Don't have the TV babysit them or the iPad babysit them, you know, get them a a stack of Uno cards, let them play. They will love board games, Monopoly, those things that we did when we're, when I was younger, you know, I'm not that young anymore, but you know, those are the things that you will keep your, the mind active, keep your body going. Exercise is a great way to keep the gut motility going into keep that poop, you know, regular and things like that. So there's just little tidbits and little information that I think can help parents too. I'm a huge fan of beets. I mean, it's one of my post-workout favorite smoothies, you know, is if you do berries with protein powder and beets, um, be careful because they will stay literally, I mean, if you get on your skin, you have to like rub it off vigorously with a rag, um, which is, I mean, I don't mind that. You have to do the same thing with curcumin, as you know, when you cook with it, your hands are orange and I'm like, yes, score. I know what that's doing to my intestines and you know, as, as we know that uh, all these polyphenols and these phytonutrients are gut bacteria, love them and they thrive on them. So for folks that get, you know, gassy and bloated with fiber, they can do really well with all these color, colorful, rich, you know, herb spices, uh, vegetables and fruits. So great information there. Uh, love that. And now let's kind of finish off with what do you do for your exercise? You're very physically fit. What's your program? What's your routine? Just kind of break it down for us in a few minutes. Yeah, I definitely, I, I make sure I exercise at least four to five times a week. I'm a big fan of high intensity and int- interval training. Um, I do, I do it on my own. I don't, right now it's kind of hard to fit in a personal trainer in my schedule, but if I can get to the gym, the key is kind of mixing it up. So, you know, you see people on the elliptical or treadmill, um, they're on there for like 60 minutes, 90 minutes. Honestly, after 15 to 30 minutes, it's kind of moot. You're not really doing anything. And just in terms of nutrition, we burn carbs before we burn fat. So just be careful. You know, we, we drink a lot of, you know, the sport drinks and those kind of sugary drinks. That's another thing that's going to impede our path to kind of losing weight and, you know, getting fit and toned is we're always going to burn carbs before fat. So make sure, you know, you're going to have a low carb diet, get that high protein and things in there. Um, my routine, I, I get on like the arc trainer, the elliptical. I'll do that for like 10 to 15 minutes. Then I'll bounce to um, doing free weights and my abs. I'll, you know, and I do squats and burpees and lunges. I do resistance bands. I do, you know, just those, those kind of exercises that are working the abs. Then I go to the, um, the machine weights and I'll do um, things that are targeting certain muscle groups, you know, my, my buys, my tries, my quads, the glutes. And I really can literally... I can be done in 45 minutes and have the best workout ever. And for other people, you know, they like things like, you know, Tabata is a big thing, um, body pump, HIIT, which is a high int- interval intensity training. Literally, you can, I, I actually saw a workout the other day in 10 minutes, you can do all that and have more results than being at a gym for one to two hours, you know? So it's really getting things every five minutes is like switching up, go on the rowing machine, get on the elliptical, go do free weights, and then really replenishing your body after that. If again, if you're traveling or if you're at home, I got, I have both flex weights at home and I have a punching bag at home. You can actually do a full routine and not have anything. Um, even just to have maybe one resistance bands and a jump, a pair of resistance bands and jump rope, and then have some uh, weights. And then Really what you can do, push-ups, you can do squats, burpees, lunges. There's tons of things. And you know what? You can YouTube these videos and maybe one day I'll make like a, a you know, exercise video. But I'll tell you, Mike, I have, I think I'm probably, I'll have to say, um, I'm cl- you know, I'm going to be 40 in two months. But after 35, after I had all my kids, I think that was a bit after 35 is probably the best I've ever felt in my life and the best I've ever looked. I just feel like everything's in sync. And I know the best years are still to come. I, you know, hormone wise and things for women, they say in your forties, it's supposed to be, you know, great in terms of your sexual health and things like that. And same thing for men, you know, we go through menopause, you guys go through anthropause. So hormones are a big thing that we have to look at. And you, you'll be surprised at how many men in their thirties and early forties have no testosterone. It's just, it's, unbelievable. And so I really tell people to focus on looking at your, you know, your hormones. Um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of sermorlin, which is a, a bioidentical uh, peptide that stimulates the human growth hormone from, from the brain. And that really, to me, is like the fountain of youth that really stimulates uh, good sleep, your sex drive, your energy. Again, these bioidentical hormones are just giving back to the body what we had once. They're not synthetic. So there's always that controversy with, oh, hormones cause cancer and heart disease. But that Women's Health Initiative study that was done in 2002, they they failed to tell us that those were synthetic hormones. You know, if we look at Premarin, which was used, or synthetic progestin, Premarin is pregnant mare urine. That's how that name came about. A horse, although it's a natural biological creature, 
horse estrogen is different than human estrogen. I'm not sure how we can process horse estrogen. Bioidentical hormones is natural to our body, and that's going to help improve your health. If you notice um, rates of cancer and heart disease and all those type of things, they increase as we age, as our hormones decrease. So it does make sense to give body the back, you know, back what it is. Yeah, biologically, things naturally we're supposed to decrease things, but we want to optimize. I don't call it anti-aging. I call it aging gracefully, optimally aging, because I don't want people to think aging is a negative thing or it's something that's evil, you know. Um, well, I think we're so big on getting cosmetic procedures and kind of making ourselves look good from the outside. But I tell patients, you can only do so much from the outside and to each his own. I'm, you're fine. Like if you want to get a little nip and tuck and do, you know, fillers and Botox, that's fine. And I think do it. It's fine. But if you're failing to address what's going on in the inside, it's going to reflect on the outside. So those people who have that natural glow and that radiance, who have beautiful hair and skin, and they just look like they're Zen, they're the people who are really taking care of themselves from the inside out. And it's reflecting on the outside. And, you know, that's what's going to show. That's how you age gracefully. Just address those problems and know that you can help it by kind of giving back your body what's you know lacking in terms of your nutrition and your hormones and those type of things. So I'm very, very big proponent of that exercise, take time to meditate or do some yoga. We all have stress in our lives, but there are two things that we can control. It's our eating habits and our exercise. We might not have control about anything else. And look, we're all stressed. We all have stressors, but it's what, how we make with the, what we make of it basically. So just find time to de-stress and exercise and eat well and teach your family, your friends, you know, your kids, the habits that you're going to start doing, because it's going to, it's going to permeate and everybody's going to feel good. And you can do things as a family, you know, for the, for people who have kids and family members and everybody that has a family do these things together, you know, do, do a fun cookout, you know, where you're actually, you know, do, do away with the hamburgers and the hot dogs and get some, you know, veggies, get some fish, get some, you know, veggie burgers, those kind of things, mushrooms, portobello mushrooms are a great way to make a burger, burger, you know, and make fun things that the kids can be volatile. You talked about the color from beets and turmeric and the saffron, you know, we actually use that in India to, to dye clothes, you know, make it a fun project with the kids, you know, let's tie dye something um, for women, like, you know, can experiment with things like I would love one day to start like a, a natural like makeup line or something using these kind of pigments that, that are found. I I mean, what a great way to, you know, still, you know, beautify yourself, but be natural about it, you know, not have to worry about the toxins we get from hair dye, um, you know, makeup, you know, sunscreen, you know, we're worried about skin cancer um, and not going out in the sun. And that's why we have vitamin D deficiency. See, most of the skin cancer that we get, our skin is our largest organ, is from the chemicals that we put on our body, the sunscreen, you know, the makeup, the you know, the shampoos that we use, you know, look at the ingredients. Those are the same ingredients that we have in our household cleaners. I, you know, the only cleaner I have in my house, I mean, I have toilet cleaner. I mean, you need to be strong there, but I can use bleach. It's vinegar and water. That's it. Clean everything with my house. It's a powerful, you know, antimicrobial. It actually, you know, will repel bugs. It's great for your granite. Um, that's all you need, vinegar. And it's, it's green, it's safe. And it's, think about it. We eat vinegar. We, you know, you put it in our salads and Apple cider vinegar is another great thing to have every morning after your warm lemon water. It just really helps detox the body. So, Perfect. Yeah. Great information there. And just wanted to highlight something about the exercise and kind of the anti-aging or optimal aging, as you put it. I do like that. That Instead of that negative connotation, I haven't really liked that word anti-aging for some reason. But uh, you know, doing full body weight squats and deadlifts, I mean, for me, I you know, when I first had my daughter, I was feeling really lethargic. We were up all night and when she would go down, we'd have a glass of wine or two or maybe three some oh, night. Yeah. I'm like, Feel gosh, why, why is my libido suck? And, and I just realized it was my lifestyle. It wasn't that I was, you know, just aging prem prematurely. It was that I was, you know, diet and lifestyle induced hormonal imbalances. And so when we, when you really clean up your diet and exercise, right, move, right, think, right. Like you mentioned meditation many times, it's amazing how your hormones rebalance themselves. And I think that's really important for, for people to, uh, you know, you got to get the lifestyle stuff first before, even if you do bioidentical, as you mentioned, and we've talked about on the show before about, uh, you know, progestin versus progesterone and all that sort of stuff. So great info there. But I think that's one to, you know, kind of just underscore that because uh, I've had people tell me like, I don't know if I'm ready for this diet program. I got to get my hormones right. Well, it's like, well, this is the step to get your hormones right. And then we can look at bioidenticals and all that. So awesome, awesome. info. And, and before we finish up here, the final question we ask uh, Dr. Verma, is if you were to have a elevator ride with uh, President Barack Obama or maybe a future president and they turned to you and said, hey, as an integrative healthcare practitioner, 
what sort of lifestyle or health tip would you want me to share with Americans that you feel may improve the health and reduce healthcare expenditures? What would you share with them in that short elevator ride? I, you know, I, I really, um, just distressed about our healthcare and how, what we're really, like I said, insurance. I would tell him, listen, President Obama, you know, we have to kind of restructure healthcare. Let's make it where we are preventing, uh, you know, diseases from coming on. Let's keep healthcare costs low. Our healthcare costs are so astronomical because everyone is sick. And, you know, and this is where insurance have to step in. Let's pay for preventive care. Let's pay for the things that I do in my office, IV nutrient therapy, the hypobaric chamber, and all these things you can find on my website, detoxing the patient, weight loss. Let's prevent people from getting obese. We are a nation of obesity. I had a friend come from Switzerland not too long, and she said, I don't mean to offend you, but why is everybody so big in America? This is, you don't see this in, you don't see this in, uh, in Europe. You know, we're walking, we're going to the, and, you know, I sat there and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, yeah, like, okay, you don't have to be skinny. You don't have to be a size two, you know, but you know, when you're, when you're six, size six, eight, fine, that's fine. But when we're going, you know, those bigger sizes, there is something that we really need to address here. So I would tell the president, let's restructure, you know, the healthcare, let's make it more for preventative um, medicine. Let's pay for those things. Let's keep healthcare costs down. And can we start looking at the, the way we're processing our food? Everybody has to be gluten-free now. Really? I know I'm not gluten sensitive, but I choose to go gluten-free because you know what? Even when I have that little bit of gluten, it does actually cause symptoms in me. So let's look at this. Let's address our micronutrient deficiency. Let's let's address the preventative health care. Let's look at what we're feeding our kids. And I know Michelle Obama is really big about you know, kind of getting, uh, you know, proper foods in you know, the schools and things like that. The, one of the worst foods that we serve are in hospitals, hospitals where the sickest people are and, you know, in cafeteria and school foods. I, you know, I, I go to these hospitals. The first thing I see when I walk in Starbucks and a McDonald's, Starbucks and a McDonald's in a hospital where people are recovering and they have all these major illnesses. That's what I would tell President Obama. Let's, you know, restructure healthcare. Let's support preventative medicine. This is the trend. This is where we're going. Let's get on par at being such an amazing country with all these opportunities and being so advanced and progressive. We are so far behind in healthcare and our nutrition and our education about what's going on. If we can get more doctors like myself, you know, who are in the integrative field to really band together and to start a movement, I'm all for it. You know, I'm going to go, I want, I want to spread that message. However, I can do it writing articles, being on TV, or just simply spreading, you know, with word of mouth with my patients and them feeling good, that's how I'm going to do it. So that's really what I would tell him. You know, let's look at the substances that we don't ban. The 12, the 12 substances I can name right off, off the bat that we don't ban, yet Europe bans, you know, things that are in soda. You know, there's carcinogenic substances in soda. 16 micrograms of that is is shown to cause cancer. Yet in each can of soda, there are 200 micrograms of these toxic chemicals. We drink soda like it's water. Let's educate our population and tell them, you know, let's get rid of these juices and let's ban it. I mean, we're still selling cigarettes and those kind of things. Big pharma, tobacco, all these things like I'm going to catch a lot of heat for it, but we really have to control it. We have to start somewhere and we have to really tell people like, let's really start looking at what is being advertised to us. What is being put in front of our kids when we're watching the Disney Channel? You know, these 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 uh, cereals, Lucky Charm, you know, whatever it is, I don't even want to name them, things that are full of colors and artificial flavorings and, you know, these drinks and these, uh, I don't even know. It's, it's, you know, I'm starting at home with my kids and I think they feel great, you know, and they don't question and they don't argue with me because they go to school. They're amazing um, students. They're gifted and they're, they're amazing athletes. And I know it's because they're eating well and they're taking their vitamins and they're not having all these processed foods, you know? So that's really what I would tell him. Let's just take a look at it and let's really help people having their insurance cover things, you know, so they don't have to feel bad about, you know, paying cash and saying, I really don't have the money to afford these treatments, which are life-saving, you know, let's look at these IV nutrient therapies that actually can help with cancer you know, doing high dose vitamin C and hydrogen peroxide and things that I do for my patients. You know, this is what helps them feel good. You have a hangover, you have a migraine, you have a common cold, come and get that Myers cocktail. And guess what? They do feel better in 24 hours. So I'm hoping to spread that message. And that's what it really, if I, if I have five minutes with president Obama or the next president that's, you know, going to take office, that's what I would tell them. 
that's really what I would tell them. Love the passion. Thanks for sharing that. Now, uh, let's kind of plug your best online resources. I know you have uh, you know social media channels and website. You want to plug those URLs in case our listeners want to reach out to you? Yeah. My website is um, www.drdeepaverma.com and that's Dr. DR and then my name. I do uh, appear on the daytime show on um, NBC, but it's local here. It's WFLA 8 in the Tampa Bay area, but it is a syndicated NBC show. It's with Jerry Pinnacoli, who's an amazing Emmy award-winning host. Um, so I do segments on there. Um, so you can go on my website and I do have links to a lot of the articles I've written. I'm on Facebook under Synergistic Integrative Health. You can find my business page there. I'm on Twitter as well too. And like you said, walking the walk and talking the talk, I do it. I practice what I preach and it's evident. So I'm not being a hypocrite. You know, people come to see me and they see you know, what I'm doing. And I think that inspires them and that I want to serve as inspiration for people. And I want to help them. My goal is really helping the patient get better. I always say, you don't have to be better than everybody else. You just have to be better than you have ever been. And it's about you feeling good. Don't judge, you know, yourself and compare yourself with other people, but it's getting to a point where you're just content with who you are inside and outside. That's all. Fantastic. Well, I'll post all that information in the show notes at highintensityhealth.com slash DR Verma. So thanks again for being on the show. I really appreciate your wisdom and passion. Thank you so much.